Good evening, everyone. I would like to start this webinar, a didactic session, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Dutkishar Gupta, Director of Medical Affairs, SEPIC, to start the session. Thank you, Dr. Dutkishar. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. A great evening to everyone, and good evening to all the distinguished panelists, speakers, and hundreds of participants joining all over the world. So this is really exciting that we see, I think it has crossed more than 500. So, you know, again, I'm reiterating today is an exciting day because we have all the stalwarts in the field of TV diagnostics in India, and even they are world famous. And from all sectors, from research, clinical trial, to policymakers, implementers, everyone we have in our panel. It's a galaxy of panel we have today. At the same time, we have the privilege to have the brain behind all these new innovations, and and these innovations actually have impacted millions of lives across the globe. So we are all aware. I'm talking about Dr. Somitesh Chakrabarty. I'll come to him. So before that, I'll just say that, yes, we are aware that drug-resistant tuberculosis is a global challenge. With our, while our battle continues with COVID-19, uh, we should also be cognizant of the fact that more than 4 million TB patients were left untreated in the last year. So we have a lot of problems. We'll be discussing all these problems and also the solutions, all the innovations in the exciting brainstorming speaking session followed by a fantastic panel discussion. I'm sure this is going to be a great academic feast. So without wasting much time, I'll just introduce the speaker first, Dr. Somitesh Chakrabarty. So he's the senior uh, research scientist of uh, CEFID uh, based in Sunnyvale, US. And we also have great panelists, Dr. Ajay Farke, I'll begin alphabetically. He's a consultant pathologist and head SRL, Dr. Avinash Farke Lab, Labs, Mumbai. We have Dr. Amita Joshi, Professor, Head Microbiology, Grant Medical College, JJ Hospital, Mumbai. We have Professor Dr. Ashak Rattan, uh, advisor, Pathkind Labs, Gurugram, and also various other credentials. Uh, Dr. Camilla Rodriguez is a consultant microbiologist in PD Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Michael Molong from Nazareth Hospital, Shillong. And finally, we have Dr. Urvashi Singh, who is a professor at and Department of Microbiology, Ames, Delhi. So I'll hand over to Dr. Somitesh Chakrabarty, who is the mastermind behind all these innovations. And we are really, really excited to hear from you. So what do you, Dr. Somitesh? Thank you very much, Dr. Dave, for such a kind introduction. And it's a privilege for me uh, to be here today in this exciting panel discussion, especially um, people who have been my mentors and who I've looked up to, Dr. Singh, Dr. Ratan, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, whom I had the opportunity of working during my formative days of my PhD in India. So this is very special for me. Um, and um, if you can, I'm, I'm going to share my screen in a second. So today I'm going to, I'm going to take you over the journey uh, on the expert MTBXDR. Um, this is not intended, intended to be, a, uh, this is a kind of a technical presentation as well as taking you over the history of what we have done over the ages um, with, with the recently launched assay and it has been, uh, the work has been going on for quite some time. So, you know, just going over the basic intended use, what is MTBXDR, as you, most of you know, it's, it's a qualitative uh, nested real-time PCR reaction and an in vitro diagnostic test for detection of extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. And it gives, uh, detects susceptibility to isoniazid, ethanamide, fluoroquinolones, and second-line injectable drugs. It's a reflex test. It's essentially not an initial diagnostic test. It's a reflex test for sputum, unprocessed or concentrated sediments that is determined to be MTB positive uh, by an initial molecular or microbiological test. So uh, coming to the need of uh, rapid near patient diagnostics for drug resistance tuberculosis, this will be more like preaching to a choir. I, I know that you guys know it pretty well, but just to give a context, I'll, I'll go over. And this is kind of the generic mantra, which we all talk about, TB disease, I mean, you know, 10 million people felt ill with TB. This is pre-COVID uh, in 2019. Almost half a million of them had MDR or RRTB and, and less than 40% access treatment, which is, which is very concerning. 
and only 31% of those who access treatment were diagnosed were uh, initiated on appropriate treatment. And under 60%, uh, the global treatment success rate for TB, MDR-TB or RRTB is under 60%. And as you know, that MDR-TB and RRTB is one of the key problems, unfortunately, in India, as well as um, South Asia in general. So more than one third of new TB cases go unnotified and undiagnosed, which is a grim scenario. Um, so, so what is needed to address the drugs resistant TB? Uh, one, one thing which is needed that everyone who works on TB knows that the one big problem about this bug is that its doubling time is 24 hours. And it grows even slow in the presence of a drug or drug resistant strains grow even slow. So it, it's excruciatingly long to get a result if you solely depend on microbiological methods, um, which has been the gold standard. Uh, so what we need is a faster and accurate diagnostics, which will reduce diagnostic delay and which is accessible, uh, which can allow the clinician to take a quick decision for an effective treatment, and it can link more patients to care. Now, uh, COVID-19, as everyone knows, has completely changed the world in a matter of less than two years. And it has impacted TB, unsurprisingly. I mean, in 2021, 4.1 million people with TB were left untreated. And only approximately 6 million received treatment about, um, from the 10 million people with TB. Now, unfortunately, in the 16 countries with the largest contribution to global shortfall in TB notifications, in 2020 compared to 2019 is India. I guess one of the reason being that India has been doing pretty well in notification. So if you do pretty well, then you probably suffer the biggest blow when, when a pandemic takes over. So it doesn't underscore a lack of reporting, but how it has been affected. Um, but that needs to be addressed. So uh, the Global Fund in partnership with uh, WHO and Stop TB uh, has issued um, a catch-up plans for to mitigate the impact on COVID-19 on TB surf, um, services. So some of the key aspects or the cornerstones of the catch-up plans um, aims to reverse the losses in diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, and to accelerate the diagnostics, make it faster, uh, provide uh, treatment to provide treatment and prevention. And it's country-specific, you know, it's country-specific, and it provides details on how to incorporate um, COVID into infectious disease essential services because this is the new normal and we have to live it with it. So adapting TB care models to the new COVID-19. Now, you know, people-centered TB care, which is, which is really important, which, which ensures fast and accurate diagnostics, uh, potential to test and treat in a single visit, and adjustment of a treatment as early as possible. Uh, one of the big things being to reduce the impact on income loss and improve the patient outcome. And I'm, as I highlighted before that, India has been doing a phenomenal job in that, like including Nixche. Um, I mean, uh, apps like Nixche, where you know it's, it's a direct reporting uh, app where you can report it online. And then, um, you know, this, this, this slogan of TB Harega Desh Jitega, which we all know, which was which took on quite a big momentum uh, till COVID-19 hit us. So. I think it's just that we need to recover and continue that momentum which we have been doing and uh, what we can do uh, to help that. Um, so, uh, you know, the WHO consolidated guidelines on drug resistance uh, tuberculosis underscored uh, the need to ensure that, you know, drug resistance to at least fluoroquinolone and injectables needs to be excluded before starting patients on treatment especially for the shorter MDR regimen. So, so, you know, this rule out test or rule in test is extremely important to give patients appropriate therapy, uh, given the fact that all these drugs, anti-TB drugs are quite toxic and have um, serious side effects. Um, and then, uh, you know, in, in um, 2019, uh, there was a new practice guideline on the treatment of drug resistant tuberculosis would say that molecular DST should be obtained for rapid detection of mutations associated with resistance. And I'll, I'll come to it in details in the later part of my talk. And when rifampin resistance is detected, additional DST should be performed immediately for the first line drugs, uh, fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides. So these are the, these are the key requirement. And, and when isoniazid resistance is found, whether it's monoresistant or associated with RIF resistance, 
resistance to fluoroquinolone should be excluded. So as you can see, the key message here is we have to provide clinicians with the faster, better treatment decisions for complicated TB, which doesn't respond to first line drugs. Now, uh, you know, as, as the saying goes, that the exciters of today are the must haves of tomorrow. But at the same time, uh, some of the exciters of today or the must haves of today can become redundant tomorrow, given the rapid progress we are having, fortunately, in TB drugs nowadays. So back when we started, um, SLIDs were one of the key regimens for treating MDR or RRTB or fluoroquinolone resistant TB. But fortunately, this is a great thing that happened as we uh, developed the assay. Um, oral regimen of TB has been developed, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, which is fluoroquinolone, but the oral regimen, which is vericulin and linizolid um, uh, and pretominate as well, which are currently being evaluated uh, at many places with many clinical trials, which I guess all of you know, uh, which our XDR assay doesn't include. However, that underscores that the point that, okay, SLIDs have still not been completely phased out in all the countries. One of the primary reason being that um, this oral regimen are not available everywhere. And maybe uh, technologies like XDR can serve as kind of a gatekeep sentinel technology just to look at if there are any prevalent SLID resistance in the community. And amikacin is still one of the drugs which will be included in the regimen. So uh, coming to the WHO endorsement, which we obtained in February this year, uh, WHO came out with this um, operational handbook on tuberculosis early this year, where they um, uh, evaluated the MTBXDR as a low complexity automated NAAT, uh, along with other tests. What they found out that the low complexity automated NAAT, which is MTBXDR for detection of resistance to isoniazid, fluoroquinolone, ethanamide, and amikacin in sputum were found to be highly accurate. They looked at the clinical performance of the data from three studies uh, performed over 1,000 participants, of which two centers were in India, Hinduja and NITRD. I'll be coming to that in details later. As you can see that the sensitivity and specificity were very high, with specificity almost reaching 100% with all the four drugs evaluated in this. So the recommendation was that a single step option is now available, which uses a first in class NAAT testing to detect both isoniazid and fluoroquinolone resistance simultaneously. Now, going back to the history, how we developed the assay, and there, this is where I'm going to come into a little bit of a technicalities um, and the science behind the XDR assay. So, uh, uh, people who have been following um, Cepheid's um, contribution to molecular diagnostics of TB. Uh, we might not be an overstatement to say this is probably the beginning of a second decade of, of, of the success story, which we have been building up, which started with Expert MTB Riff back in 2010, uh, followed by Expert MTB Riff Ultra and Expert MTB Riff XDR, which was launched in um, 2020. So it's a single decade when we moved over from uh, uh, making a complex technology very easy, direct sample to answer technology where you could take a sputum and put it in a system where you could get the answer in a little over an hour to having an exceptional clinical performance with more accurate results and more sensitive diagnostics to an expanded diagnostic scope. And while the cartridge might look the same from outside, but a lot of innovation has been going on, um, you know, alongside. So, so, you know, we, we, in 2010, when we first launched the WHO endorsed TB test, this was a uh, transition from four color instrument to a six color instrument. And then in 2017, when we increased the sensitivity of this assay to uh, have a better sensitivity in smear negative samples, we also introduced melt curve analysis and a bigger tube, which would enable a greater amount of material to be put into the PCR and more accurate results as, as a matter of fact, pinpointing mutation using melt curve analysis. And then in 2020, we transitioned from six color to a 10 color instrument with a greater expanded capability and in increasing the spectrum of uh, diagnosis of resistance. So it has been kind of a trailblazing story where 
as we moved on, it was underscored by some new innovation or the other. Um, now, it started, all started with the prototype XDR assay cartridge um, back in uh, 2012, 2011, when um, Cepheid and Rutgers University decided to collaborate together on seeing whether we can fit in um, a, a, a 10 plex assay in a single system uh, where, and that was a time, you know, when the NTB strategy called for universal access to DST. Uh, yet in 2017, only 30% of TB cases notified were tested for rifampin resistance. And among the MDR and RRDR TB patients, uh, only 50% were tested for resistance to fluoroquinolones and SLIDs. So that was the situation was ripe. That was the best time to look for an assay, which would be a near patient assay, direct sample to answer, which could detect the resistance uh, to isoniazid fluoroquinolone and SLIDs. And so what we did is that we developed a prototype in which we used melt curve analysis to detect the resistances. Uh, the genes for resistance, so isoniazid, fluoroquinolone, and SLIDs were analyzed, and we introduced the new 10-color-based workflow. And the paper was published in 2016. So what is the 10-color technology? You know, 10-color technology is pretty much like upgrading your computer by adding more RAM or disk space. Your basic computer doesn't change, but it becomes more efficient, faster, better. So what we do is that we take a six color module and we calibrate it to teach the instrument to learn to recognize four additional dyes. So there's no change in hardware, no change in the instrument in general. It's just a calibration, optical calibration, which enhances and increases the capability of the instrument to detect more colors. It has an innovation excitation detection technique, which I'll be coming in my next slide and detects an expanded number of genetic targets. As you can see that we can definitely go up to 10 plus plex in the system. And it delivers the same speed and accuracy as I, as I mentioned that the instrument as a whole doesn't change. Um, so this is um, a schematic as I show on the left, left side of the screen, you will see this is the schematic where we show the excitation emission spectra. And um, uh, people who are familiar with excitation emission spectra of um, fluorescent dyes will know that majority of the dyes they are excited at an emission uh, are very closely spaced together in terms of wavelength. Like blue excitation will be green emission, green excitation will be yellow emission. So if you look in the spectrum, they're very closely spaced. However, the trick was to develop dyes where the excitation and the emission will be far apart, which is called large stoke ships dyes. And that was the critical chemistry, which enabled us to develop off axis dyes, because these are on axis dyes which we had in the six color instrument. We developed this four off axis dyes where very low excitation wavelength could generate fluorescence at very high wavelength. So we could essentially use a single excitation channel to generate multiple emissions, which you see here. And one of the, one of the diagrams which shows here is that the black one shows the general dyes. As you see, this is the excitation, this is the emission. They're very closely spaced. And the red ones show the new dye. As you can see that we use the same excitation but the emission are much at a much higher wavelength. So we can allow this technology and the chemistry to add on four different dyes and expand the system to 10 color, which is further expandable, depending on the chemistry of the dye, uh, which we can devise. So we did a clinical evaluation of the prototype assay cartridge, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And as you can see here that the sensitivities are pretty good, but they are not above 90. And the sensitivities um, differed when we looked at moxifloxus in different critical concentrations of breakthroughs. You know, in one case, we had a much higher sensitivity, but that came at the cost of a specificity. And however, the specificity of the assay was extremely high in all cases. I would say the sensitivities aren't that bad, but well, we wanted greater than 90. When you compare to sequencing, I mean, this is essentially an assay which picks up mutation, right? It detects sequences we had a phenomenal performance. And, and one thing which it helped us recognize is that, well, there is a gap between uh, phenotype, genotype. Uh, there's a discordance where we are missing certain mutations where we can include them, additional targets to increase the sensitivity, especially with uh, isoniazid resistance. With fluoroquinolone resistance, uh, we should be able to differentiate between low versus high resistance because at that time, clear phenotype, phenotype genotype relationship between 
the critical concentration and the type of mutation has been emerging and a lot of functional genomic studies were being carried out which clearly proved uh, that uh, how mutations are related to phenotypes and we knew that we could do better with fluoroquinolone resistance and then SLID resistance we could do cross resistance versus individual resistance especially because you know um, capriomycin and canamycin being outlawed and amikacin being still kept in. So we needed to see a way to differentiate between these three. So with that in mind, Cepheid, Find, and Rutgers University, they collaborated together and we started improving the prototype uh, to a product. So we went through several stages of improvement. And so we added more targets. We brought down the time. We redesigned some of the probes and we ensured that we get more accurate results. So in terms of Adding more targets, we added um, OxyR AHPC uh, intergenic region and the FabG1 uh, genes to increase the sensitivity of isoniazid resistance. The time to results, the prototype card was a little over two hours. We brought it down to under 90 minutes. We designed special uh, probes. We modified some of the probe designs, as I mentioned, to recognize and uh, precisely detect mutations uh, so that we could pinpoint phenotype genotype relationship. And then with the results as a natural follow-up, we were able to predict low versus high resistance. So the XDR cartridge essentially is um, the assay turnaround time, as I told you, it's less than 90 minutes. It's a closed cartridge system, exactly same as gene expert MT and ultra, which you've been seeing. It's, it's suitable for unprocessed un sputum and concentrated sputum sediments and can be performed in a 10 color gene expert instrument. As you can see, it greatly simplifies the workflow, which is shown in the schematic that you uh, will get an ultra result in a little over an hour, and then it could either be uh, susceptible, uh, RIF susceptible, which could indicate it, it might be a mono INH, or it could be RIF resistance, which could indicate it's an MDR. And if it's rifampin susceptible, it's definitely uh, an MDR or a RIF mono resistance, which doesn't happen that much. So, then you reflex it to MTBXDR, which happens in less than 90 minutes, and you can initiate or optimize the treatment based on the results on the same day. And you compare to uh, phenotypic testing, which takes almost a month or more than a month. So this is a significant reduction in the workflow and treatment initiation. So as I, as I, as I mentioned, I'm just going to quickly browse through this. What is the 10 color system? It's the same system, it's the same instrument. It's just you add a calibration and it upgrades. And XDR workflow is the same easy workflow. There's no difference in the XDR workflow for a lab technician who is trained in doing ultra or expert MTB. It's the same adding the SR reagent to the sputum, incubating for 15 minutes, then pipetting the inactivated sample into cartridge, insert the cartridge and hit start. And the test begins. So uh, as I was saying that we added um, new gene targets, and this is, this is where it, it kind of shows all the gene targets which is used in the assay. And one of the key offerings which we have here are low resistance, a quantitative resistance detection. I mean, predicting low resistance to fluoroquinolones and isoniazid, which are connected with specific mutations. So coming to the analytical and clinical validations of the assay. Now, the first independent evaluation of this expert MTB XDR, which is the launch product, was um, done in 2020. It's a detailed analytical and clinical um, uh, investigation, which presents all the verification and validation studies which were performed. We, we um, showed that the limit of detection is comparable to expert MTB RIF in terms of the uh, RPOB limit of detection, as well as ultra, the RPOB limited, uh, limit of detection, not the TB detection. TB detection of ultra is much, much better, but it's comparable to expert MTB XDR. So the uh, expert MTB RIF, so the uh, idea is that if any expert MTB RIF sample is positive, it's likely that it will be positive by expert MTB XDR assay also. We performed a clinical study with 100 sputum and 20, 214 clinical isolates um, uh, from um, uh, two different sites in South Korea and China, showed a sensitivity of 94 to 100% and specificity of 100% of all the drugs except for ethionamide, um, uh, and the reason is because we only target the INHA promoter gene for ethionamide. There are many other mechanisms which we don't, because ethionamide was not a primary uh, target for us when we designed the assay. It was just an add-on 
based on a KOL and um, uh, feedback and, and the voice of customer. So 16 clinically significant mutations were challenged. The assay picked up really well. And we had, as I mentioned, we had an LOD of 136 CFU per ml with unprocessed sputum and 86 CFU per ml with, um, uh, with sediment, um, NALC and AOH treated sediment, which is uh, comparable to expert MTB RIF. Now, this is where I'm coming a little more into the science and the te technique what we do. So how can we uh, give up such precise susceptibility results? We can say, what is low, what is high? This is done by the virtue of looking at the TM profiles. So this, this graph, it actually shows that the clustering of the TM for the wild type and the mutant TM for all the different analytes, and I've, and I've uh, shown with the brackets, uh, each vertical axis shows a wild type TM or a mutant TM. For example, here you have INHA I, I promoter. All the green clusters, which you see here, are wild type TMs. And this is from nearly 300 clinical samples, which we have tested. And all the other colored um, um, clusters, which you see here, each cluster is composed of one open circle, which is one sample, TM from one sample, single sample. As you can see that these are the TMs. So what, is, what I want to draw your attention to is that if you look at this clustering, it's extremely precise, extremely precise. And, 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 and the standard deviation of the TMs are extremely low. And it has been done over several different hundreds of modules and hundreds of clinical samples from different sources. Still, it has a pristine uh, clustering of TMs, which will help us identify the precise TMs very clearly. And depending on where your mutant TM lies, it corresponds to a specific mutation. And that helps us in very precise identification of what the mutations are and what could be its critical concentration and what could be the phenotype corresponding to that mutation. Coming to heteroresistance de uh, detection, which is, which is I think very important for fluoroquinolone at least because of uh, I think usage of fluoroquinolone in other communicable diseases or infectious diseases in the community. What I show here is that on the x-axis you see increasing percentage of mutant and on the y-axis you see the uh, TMs with, with the blue uh, dots showing the wild type TMs and the pink dots showing the mutant TMs. As you can see, as the concentration of the mutation increases, you are beginning to get more and more mutant TMs at a certain point of time you get both wild type and mutant TMs, which help us identify heteroresistance or mutation in the background of wild type. Now, this is a, a kind of a, 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 a quick look at what kind of uh, result output we could get. And this is a compilation of the result output which we got from many clinical samples, which we used in our clinical trial. I mean, this is um, probably, I've taken from five different clinical trials. As you can see that, it's a typical result output shows uh, that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very clear resistance profile you can obtain. And this clear resistance profile, which you can obtain from different samples, which is patient specific, can allow the clinician to take a very definitive and accurate treatment decision based on what kind of resistance profile you have obtained. For example, I mean, you, you, can, you can see here that this is where canamycin resistance is there, but it's susceptible to amikacin. This patient cannot be treated with isoniazid or fluoroquinolone, but definitely, if necessary, amikacin could be included in the treatment. Similarly, for a short course therapy, which includes high, high dose isoniazid and moxifloxacin, we have detected low INH resistance and low fluoroquinolone resistance, which opens up the possibility of treating this patient with high dose of fluoroquinolone and isoniazid. So that's kind of the real feature. Uh, which we want to underscore that we are giving clinicians a chance to take more accurate treatment decisions. Now, there was this, um, I just wanted to highlight this uh, paper on the added value of expert MTB XDR, um, which came out in 2020. Uh, it, 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 I, would, I would recommend um, you to go over this, but I want to underscore one thing here, which, which they have mentioned, is that uncertainty about its performance in patients with MTB trace detected. Yes. We don't recommend reflexing uh, trace detected from ultra into XDR because MTB trace detected in ultra underscores that there is approximately 50 to 100 bacilli in the sample. 
which is below the level of detection by the XDR assay. However, if it's from the same sputum sample, definitely there's no point going, but if it's a spot sample, which is trace, and if the morning sample from the same patient comes with the rifampin quantitation, then it could reflect to the XDR assay. So it's a case by case basis and it will completely depend on the clinician's decision at the time. Uh, so the uh, further analytical evaluation of this assay was performed um, by FIND, uh, you know, and it, it did show same things as we noticed in our, um, uh, which was published in our JCLIN micro paper, um, where Rutgers and um, Sefiet did the testing. Uh, the, the equivalent limit of detection was demonstrated to expert MTB RIF. 100% um, of resistance mutations were detected. For heteroresistance, we could detect up to 10 to 25% of isoniazid to fluoroquinolone resistance. Wasn't as great with respect to SLID. We could detect approximately 50%. And it could detect a wide range of globally relevant canonical mutations, which came from five different countries, uh, which are most of them, which are HBDCs. It's a reliable sensitive assay. Uh, then comparing to its detection rate, as I mentioned that the LODs are comparable and this reinforces the fact that when XDR is compared to expert MTB RIF Ultra in terms of TB detection, although I should rate rate, XDR should not be used as an initial test for TB detection. It's a reflex test, but this shows the concordance of the positive person agreement and the negative person agreement with, uh, with the RIF assay and the Ultra assay respectively. The clinical performance of um, the FIND study was uh, a, a big undertaking and, and FIND uh, drove this uh, with um, Cepheid. And this was performed in um, uh, South Africa, India, uh, and Moldova, and, and two sites in India. And Dr. Rodriguez was also involved in this um, study at Hinduja. And as you can see that this was done in two different ways. One was retrospective, which was frozen archival sputum. And the other part of the study is prospective study, which was done with fresh sputum, which I'm going to come in a mo moment. As you can see that uh, compared to phenotypic DST versus sequencing, the assay performance has been extremely high, very high. I just wanted to underscore that ethanamide performance was because the reporting was based only on detection of INHA promoter mutation, uh, resulting in lower sensitivity. And this is due to a customer request who told us that since even if you could detect a part of ethinamide resistance using INHA promoter, it's still acceptable. So uh, that was the reason, but you look at the sequencing sensitivity and specificity, they are all close to 100. Similarly, similar performance characteristics were obtained with, um, uh, with our uh, prospective samples, which are fresh sputum samples, underscoring the fact that this test is equally good in both frozen and fresh clinical specimens, being able to pick up all the canonical mutations and showing high degree of sensitivity and specificity uh, with, with, with the clinical samples. Now, one of the reasons why capriomycin here is low, because I have, I have already pointed out that our ability to peak heteroresistance is for capriomycin was only 60%. We needed to have 60% of the mutant sequence present. And there were several samples here which were heteroresistant for capriomycin, which could only be detected by deep sequencing and our assay missed it. So that's all um, uh, for me, and I'll be glad to take the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Samitesh. It's a fascinating presentation, wonderful journey of innovation. So uh, now this forum is open for a question and answer. I can see quite a few questions being posted in the QA group. Uh, and chat section, so definitely these will be answered. But if anybody wants to ask Dr. Somitesh, this is a great opportunity to have a direct interaction with him. Uh, Dr. Somitesh, could I ask you a question, please? Yeah, sure. When are we going to see a gene expert that can uh, uh, be process, uh, samples be processed from positive culture samples? Are we going to see it anytime soon? That's a, that's a great question. Actually, we, we, we can use midget samples to, um, midget positive samples to do uh, assays in XDR. Uh, I have um, intentionally omitted this because so far this hasn't been yet um, cleared for use in India. 
and this was specifically for an India specific forum. I haven't, but I would, I would um, uh, recommend you to look at the papers which were published from FIND where they have, uh, you know, I, I presented the data on retrospective and prospective. There was a separate analysis done on midget, midget cultures, both analytical and clinical, and we saw similar levels of performance. So to answer your question, absolutely yes. No, we are doing it. We are doing it anyway, based on papers, but you know, it's still off label. So I would like that removed. So we are comfortable with it. Yeah, I would, I would want to direct that to our regulatory um, folks at Cepheid here. So they will be able to discuss that and hopefully we are on a path to have it clear very soon. Uh, but yes, I mean, it works for major cultures, it does. Thanks, thanks a lot. Sure. Pomitesh, this is Camila. Have you looked at extra pulmonary TB? Um, not with not with XDR, not with the XDR assay. But I, I would I would my um, prediction would be that uh, whatever extra pulmonary assay uh, studies have been done so far with expert MTB RIF Ultra and expert MTB RIF that could be applicable to the XDR assay. Uh, it, you know, but we don't claim anything, and all those extra pulmonary testing are off label because we haven't done any analytical or clinical testing, not yet. So in effect, if you could get through this culture thing, it probably will help them, especially the extra pulmonary specimens. Uh, certainly, don't... certainly uh, it will. But I, I would also want to underscore one thing which, we, which I didn't mention is that, you know, with the new drugs being um, tested and so many clinical trials, NICS-DB trial, TRUST trial, and all these trials which are being taken on BPAL, this could also serve as a great companion diagnostic for patient enrollment, screening, for patient eligibility for uh, these trials to this oral regimen and the new drugs which are coming out. So that could also be one thing. And then if you have uh, you know, archival uh, clinical samples where you want to look at uh, the surveillance and, and the fact that you can use the cultures to uh, look at that, it could also serve as a good surveillance tool, although it's not a high throughput assay, but still uh, those opens up the exciting you know propositions um, now that uh, yeah. sorry you know, for extra pulmonary uh, samples i guess the the gene expert uh, as it is is off label usage it is am i right is. correct me if i'm it is clear. you are right but we saying. have right. yeah we have uh, and camellia's group and several other people have actually tested in a lot of extra pulmonary samples and found it to be very useful so the is off-label, but it works. The it, is is and I, it is, it is. It is true. And I, I think I think we, we are aware of that. And I think at, a, um, uh, at least at some part at Cepheid, we are, we are taking this very seriously and we are trying to see if we can do any systematic studies or we can use the currently existing data to see whether we can include or extend the labeling into at least some extra pulmonary samples. But I don't think it's going to happen yet. Uh, it may take some time. But we, we, I agree with you, Dr. Singh. A lot of studies, like Dr. Rodriguez has done, done it. Many, and especially like CSF, TB meningitis, which is a relatively easy sample to process. You know, a, a study have been done with TB meningitis, tissue biopsy, you know, lung biopsy, and even even a, a big amount of focus has been on stool, as you've seen that KNMC, and find has performed this study for pediatric TB detection, uh, which is gastric lavage uh, as, an, um, you know, as an alternative to gastric lavage stool. A lot of study has been done, but since Cepheid by itself hasn't done any systematic study, we haven't done any validation and verification, we cannot have any claim. This will always be off label unless we yeah, do we, it. We're part of the fine study and we've published ourselves in a large number of extra pulmonary samples. And we routinely put it to use for diagnosis and uh, treatment initiation and extra pulmonary samples. So. Right. I mean, I'm glad to know that you're doing it and you don't wait for, <laughs> you know, um, official uh, claim from Cepheid. So, uh, no, the we... WHO recommended it way back in 2013. Yeah, it does. It was, yeah. Uh, at, least, at least for and, the CSF they did. Had, I'm sorry. They had evidence base for it. So the yes. WHO 2013 guidelines had... Uh, evidence base where our paper, Dr. Mila's paper, and several other papers all over the world were quoted. And, uh, 
Absolutely, absolutely. But you know, it's it's a regulatory claim is kind of a different thing than a recommendation from WHO, and we are extremely happy that they did. I mean, as a matter of fact, if you you you, you definitely know, Doctor Singh, as you mentioned, that the initial recommendation for ultra for WHO also included CSF, TB meningitis, based on the Lancet paper. But we didn't make any claims. Uh, but we were happy that WHO recommended that it could be used for detection of TB meningitis. Um, can I ask a question, please? Sure, sure. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned that this is a reflex test, but what if we have an AFB1 positive uh, patient? Is it totally out of ordinary to use it as a first-line test and not a reflex test in that case? What we wouldn't recommend it to be used as a first-line test. I mean, it's not the intended use. The intended use is a reflex because uh, it, it is meant to be used for uh, uh, a sample where you get a call for rifampicin, either a susceptible or a resistance result. And then you reflex to know uh, what is the broad spectrum resistance to other drugs. But I, I, I have heard that, you know, in countries like Eastern Europe, in Moldova, where there is a significant presence of XDRTB and pre-XDRTB, they would probably split a sputum sample. I'm not giving any ideas here. I'm just saying what I know. Uh, they would split a sputum sample to run both ultra and XDR in parallel to save time because they know that the patients who are coming are already coming with a huge burden of pre-XDR, XDR, MDRTB. But that's not the intended use. We recommend it to be used as a reflex test. Okay, thank you. Sure. So I guess that brings us to a suggestion. Why don't you pull RIF along with the rest of the drugs and the XDR in your next uh, evolution? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> So I see a few of the participants raising hands. So if you can unmute yourself and ask, because we have very limited time for this question and answer session. After that, yeah, I, I, uh, Dr. Dave, I think Dr. Ratan had a question. I mean, Dr. Ratan. Yeah, uh, one, there were two parts. One was that now that the definition of XDR has changed, would you then try to uh, uh, re-modify the definition of the XDR cartridge? And the second one related to that is, will this XDR cartridge run on the same machine? Because my impression was the machine needs to be changed and upgraded. Yes, uh, to answer your first question, Dr. Ratan, yes. Um, but that that's, uh, changing the definition is probably not in the jurisdiction of CEFI. The change in definition has, has to come in, in line with how regulatory agencies or WHO wants us to do and if the if the if the definition now changes to resistant to resistance to first line drugs fluoroquinolone and oral regimen yes the reg, uh, the definition will change um, and certainly we have this in mind and future assays will address that where we will be probably completely outlawing the slid portion and include the oral regimen into the into that and to answer your second question it needs an upgrade you cannot run the xdr assay in a six color instrument you either need to swap the module with the new 10 color module, or you need to do a calibration to upgrade the modules into 10 color. However, the 10 color instrument can be used for all existing assets for Cephi. Okay. It's just that in a six color instrument, you cannot use XDR. Right. Can I ask one question? Sure. Now, there were multiple machines, I think more than a 1,600, 1,700 put across in the national program, which have the four color, I mean, the, your old modules, right? So now if you ask Government of India to again invest for your 10 color module, so in a country like us, it becomes very difficult. But for you to upgrade by calibration is something which you need to do for the Government of India if you want us to go in for this. Don't you think that would be in the interest of the Indian population, which is having such a high burden of tuberculosis and DRTB. I direct this question to marketing and Dr. Deb. Uh, tough question for me. I think I'll have to wait and take some consensus decision from separate India. So Shrikant, if you want to add anything, you're welcome. 
no, I think we can we can decide in the later on and we can let you know. Thank you. We can revert later, ma'am. Fine. Well, so thank you, Dr. Samitesh. I see you have quite a few questions in the chat box. So, and also uh, I'm beginning this panel discussion. I'll be really happy if you are there and definitely you can you know, add your thoughts in few of the you know questions. So sure. this is largely covered by your talk, but you know, few of the things I'd like to learn uh, from the esteemed panelists. So I'll begin with uh, Professor Ashok Ratan, sir. Sir, to begin with, uh, I would request you to provide some thoughts on the current tuberculosis diagnostic algorithm and the selection of anti-tuberculosis drugs for MDR and XDR TB. Right. Let me begin by congratulating uh, Sumitesh for his excellent work, and I hope that he will continue to add and respond as things change. Uh, important element in NTB strategy to eliminate tuberculosis focuses on diagnosing and treatment of 8 million cases every year. It is critical to have microbiological diagnosis of TB cases and early diagnosis of tuberculosis should be followed by universal drug susceptibility. In early 2021, many changes have been suggested by WHO which uh, Sumitesh had mentioned, in a series of publications consolidating various guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis. Based on the observation that second-line drug regimes containing injectable aminoglycosides such as canamycin or capromycin had higher failure rate, higher relapses, and more toxicity and mortality, and the success of, in South Africa with all oral Badoquilin containing BPAL regime and its registration by US FDA, it has been suggested that instead of smear microscopy, higher diagnostic accuracy of ex gene expert ULTRA should make this as the initial test for diagnosis of tuberculosis, both for pulmonary and extrapulmonary tuberculosis in both adults and children. Drugs used for treatment of tuberculosis have also been classified into three groups. Group A containing bedaquilin, linazolid, and fluoroquinolones, levoflox, and moxiflox. Group B contains clofamazine, cycloserine, and terizodone, while all other drugs have been relegated to C group. The definition of MDR has remained the same, but a new definition of pre-XDR which includes fluoroquinolones along with MDR resistance and uh, XDR, which means along with pre-XDR, you would have resistance to one of the one more additional group A drugs. These are the changes which have been suggested and that now changes the scenario of how we should diagnose and treat tuberculosis. Thank you, sir. This gives a very nice background and a very clear knowledge to everyone, including the participants. So thank you for the very lucid explanation. So my next question to Dr. Rigveshi Singh. Uh, Madam, so in relation to Dr. Somitesh's presentation, so how a test like expert in TBXDR can change the lives of TB patients and also the lab professionals? A broad question, but you are the ideal person to address. Thank you so much for the question. And uh, let me deal with it like this, that uh, what Dr. Ratan just highlighted, the definition of pre-XDR and XDR has had to be changed per force. By per force, what I mean is the, the treatment for MDR-TB is based on second line drugs. Now the second line drugs, despite the best of regimens, best of trials, were not really able to achieve better than 45% to 50% cure rates. The regimens which were being used till the red, uh, you know, till yesteryears. And it's, it's only after so many years that we have had this new medicine, the bedaquilin, the newer uh, drugs like the lamin, it have just come in, you know, after years of research. So 
it, it became imminent to change the treatment guidelines from the earlier combinations to the newer uh, drugs. And, uh, you know, the recent trials, um, you know, the, um, the, you talked about the next trial, there is a Xenix trial which talks about uh, BPAL, Pritominate, Linezol, it combined with Bilaculin. So what I'm trying to arrive at is this is an evolution that will go on, like I talked about evolution to doxomethase. So this evolution in the treatment regimen or the treatment strategies will continue. And there may be newer drugs. And you know, despite the availability of these new drugs that I just mentioned, we are already seeing failures to these new drugs as well. So this evolution will go on because probably the bug is smarter than us, which it has proven millions of years and it is still there and all of us are fighting. So coming back to your question, how this particular, uh, you know, development that I think it's it's a much um, sought for, much uh, needed, um, uh, you know, development in the field of uh, diagnosis of tuberculosis, which like Dr. Ratan said is essential to design the treatment regimen. So the, this will bring a sea change. Let me put it in, in just two words. Sea change in how we deal with our TB patients. So the best would be that we break the chains of transmission, like I always say. And how better to do it than diagnose at the earliest. So uh, though we have the line probe assay, though we have, um, you know, the, the of course, the um, uh, Phenotypic DST, but the flaws we know with all of these phenotypic DST takes much longer. Though it is the gold standard and I maintain it is the gold standard, but the time lost will continue the patient, continue the deterioration in the patient's uh, well-being as well as the transmission will continue. So if we wait for the phenotypic DST to come through and then change the treatment, we may already subject the patient to further resistance acquisition. We are aware that if we are giving a wrong uh, combination regimen, the resistance acquisition goes on. So it would be ideal that the patient comes to a center or the center goes to, uh, you know, active screening is part of the RNTC, uh, the NTEP. So the moment we diagnose the patient is what Dr. Ratan mentioned as universal DST. And if we could offer at the, you know, at the, at the outset, we, we detect the rifampicin resistance and we immediately are able to decide the regimen. So the time saved there would actually have to be, we'll have to see the economic, uh, you know, uh, gain uh, if uh, that we get uh, diagnosing at the outset, initiating the right regimen at the outset. So um, one of course is that, that the patient gets the benefit, the transmission gets, so, you know, the transmission is another story. The contacts of MDR patients, we do not have the best regimen available how to treat the infection in these patients. So the best we could actually do is we diagnose MDR and we diagnose any additional resistance and initiate the right regimen at the outset. And the like, you know, they like you said, like Samitesh said, Indian TB program is doing extremely well. If we could actually incorporate this in the TB program, we could actually make a difference. So do not worry about the lab workers. We are eager to help. So you said, how will it change the life of the lab uh, professionals? We would be eager to do the gold standard phenotypic, but this simplify the lives of the physicians and most of the patients because you'll get the right regimen, right treatment at the outset. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Very insightful and uh, really scary to learn even the newer regiments are, you know, giving some resistance. So great insight from you. Uh, my next question to Camilla, ma'am. Uh, madam, you are part of the large clinical trial and you very evaluated this expert MTB XDR in a prospective multi-center cross-sectional cross diagnostic accuracy study. So if you can share the key learnings from that study. Madam, you're on mute. Yeah, Samitesh did show this, but to just sort of put it into a nutshell, we did a prospective multicenter cross-sectional study for diagnostic accuracy as a reflex test on about 710 consecutive patients who had at least one risk factor for DRTB. We did it, we did this across four sites. Two were in India. And basically they were on patients, like we said, who are MTB positive on either expert ultra or expert MTB rate. 
the good part of this study was that we had a composite, composite reference standard which included both phenotypic midget DST as well as whole genome sequencing. And that actually fully characterized the, the performance. So, you know, you're, you've got a great phenotypic test and you've also got whole genome sequencing that's going to be done on all the culture positive samples. So the sensitivity was a 94% for INH and the fluoroquinolones. It was certainly lower for the second line injectables, 86, 73, and 61 for canamycin, amikacin, and caprio respectively. And like Somitesh did specify, 54, just 54% for ethionamide, because it really wasn't meant to look at ethionamide, but again, it's helpful in ruling in ethionamide resistance if it's typically detected. What I found really good was that it actually picked up low levels of resistance for fluoroquinolones, which correlate well with the mutations at uh, gyrase A, 1991, and also for low level resistance for isoniazid as well. So you could ramp up the concentration, uh, the dose for, for INH, at, this was at the CAD G level. And uh, similarly for, for fluoroquinolones, you could ramp up the dose of moxiflox if you got a low level resistance. Another is uh, peculiar, I don't know what the reason for this was, that the performance varied by site. The Delhi site actually showed that the performance of INH was lower than all the other sites. And uh, though the WGS actually ruled out any high confidence mutation in the sensitivity of, of these of the samples there, you know, basically they found that it was out of coverage in the INH, et cetera. And similarly, the Delhi site also had a lower sensitivity Again, possibly due to hetero, hetero minor resistant populations. So all in all, it showed a sensitivity about 94 for INH and lower for second line injectables. Excellent specificity. That was really reassuring. Specificity was more than 98% overall for all. So that's something that, you know, it's maintained. Yeah, I think that's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. This is really a pivotal study. So my question to uh, Dr. Amita, ma'am. Uh, so I'll just take one step backward. And if you, madam, if you can share the challenges in the drug resistance tuberculosis diagnosis and how you think as India as a country can mitigate them. I think we all know, unfortunately, we are the leaders as far as uh, TB, DRTB or MDRTB is concerned worldwide. And... Uh, not to, and it is difficult to diagnose MDR and XDR-TB. Since 2000, we have seen number of tests which were worldwide also introduced within the Indian national program. Similarly, we saw a lot of drugs also like bedaculin, delaminate, and now the pretonomide coming in the BPAL regime that we are uh, initiated. Already the Mumbai site has initiated that regime. But these drugs have yet not reached to the extent that we thought we, it would be reaching. So when we made the national strategic plan way back, and it is there on the public domain, that is the 2017, 2025 for everyone who can see, we had a vision that we'll have a TB-free India. And the goal was we need to reduce not only the TB, but also reduce the morbid, uh, morbidity and mortality. Okay, and for that half, if you see, we were going quite well till this epidemic of COVID came in, okay? So a lot of machineries had come in, a lot of manpower had uh, put up and uh, the latest technology, even the whole genome sequencing was well-placed geographically across India. But with this pandemic, like was mentioned by uh, Sir also in the initial lecture, that it derailed not only the TB program, but every program, national program in India got derailed, we can say for these two years and we are gradually now picking up. So if you ask me what is a main challenge, first, yes, we did build up infrastructure, but not that much as we would have expected if we have to cover the entire population. So our population is the main issue. Secondly, we did put in resources, but the resources were not, and I will, I mean, it's not nice to say so, but they never were, uh, what you say, uh, enough to have an unlimited supply, whether it was for the kids or whether it was for the 
medicines that we wanted to use. There are times when the labs dry out with reagents. There are times when the program is drying out of the treatment protocols also, which is over there. Something which worsened during this uh, pandemic because lots of funds, as you all are aware, got diverted towards the COVID. So we can't uh, even uh, say because we did have a large number of COVID also coming in. So our challenge, we will say, is mainly resources at present. Trained infrastructure, I mean, not only trained personnel, which we had, unfortunately got diverted towards the COVID. You know, we saw lots of our expertise going into and because naturally they had better opportunity for the COVID diagnosis. So we lost a lot of trained personals over there. I'm talking from the program aspect, which is there. And though the notification was building up in the last two years, it is not that that we have gone. So we had everything built up and we had a vision, but unfortunately a lot of things could go. So if you ask me now, if I have to pick up again, we have already come up with a PMDT, that is a programmatic management. We have already initiated the training all over across India. And uh, in spite of uh, the COVID on a virtual platform, the trainings are gone. And I think Maharashtra has completed this training. And we are trying to come back to the same gist that we were in, that we were in 2019. So education, IEC, then whatever said and done, the stigma which is attached to TB, unfortunately, is not gone. So that part is always will be a challenge because still people accept that they have TB or somebody in their family has TB. You know, uh, it'll all be a hush hush uh, affair, which is over there. So everything, if you go to see, but always we see the program. I think TB is a beautiful program where it has taken not only the public, but even the private sector labs and try to see that everything is available to whatever masses that we can done those free of cost and those who can afford at a very, very reasonable cost. So that's what I will say is our challenge at present. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So this is really a holistic view and we all appreciate your contribution. In fact, everybody's contribution in this forum. So we know the country as a whole, we are really grateful to all your hard work and all this policy and touching lives. So my next question to Dr. Ajay Farke, uh, how private sector can help the national TB program to achieve the notifications for TB and drug resistant TB in coming years? Because that's a challenge, as you can see. Previously it was not, but because of COVID, as Madam said, everything got derailed. So how this can be you know, brought in line? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, like Ma'am said in the NSP, a lot of these points have been covered in great depth. Uh, also, uh, programs like IPACT have really helped us, have helped the uh, patients to actually afford or even sometimes get uh, diagnosis free of cost. So I'll just touch upon a few points which I think are important. Uh, first of all, 80% of people with TB tend to attend the private sector. Uh, so working with the private sector is extremely crucial. And there are multiple stakeholders in this. We think of the private labs as a major stakeholder, but there are also obviously uh, the treating physicians and pharmacies, which play a very, very crucial part, if not the most crucial part. Now, uh, when you talk about the pharmacies, there are a lot of pharmacies which actually have not been notifying it on time. So something, the regular surveillance activities have to be done to include them in the program. Uh, then the any program once it started has to have ongoing education and connection with all the stakeholders and a lot of handholding and manpower and your resource support should be there. And they should continue even after the transition into the uh, post any funded program. Then uh, XDR, MDR and XDR TB are actually some uh, very, very serious diseases and they need to be treated by uh, doctors who have a lot of experience. And currently what we see in the private sector in certain places is that they are treated by multiple professionals who may not have the right experience. So these kind of diseases should be treated by a few select uh, doctors who are very good at this. Then data and API integration should, uh, manual data entry is uh, something which is now should be sort of gradually phased out. I think the next share uh, initiative is excellent. And if you're able to do API integrations right from diagnostic labs and pharmacy chains directly to flow into the next share portal, it will help immensely with the, obviously a data validation step in between. And then finally, I would like to say that, uh, you know, the policy for private sector engagement should be earmarked along with the funding for the same. And uh, because the funds which are actually earmarked for private sector activities also should be fully utilized at the state as well as the district level. And uh, 
many of the PPM coordinator positions, which we see, which are dealing with the private labs, many of the positions were not filled up because of COVID. They were obviously most of the resources were diverted. So again, uh, many of these positions should be filled up and they should be used for TB. Uh, so these are my, I just wanted to summarize it in brief. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parke. So this is really helpful for us. So uh, now my next question to Dr. Michael Mollum. So you're working in, a, in the northeast part of the country uh, relentlessly for quite a few years in this tuberculosis and pioneered various things. So we'd like to learn from you what are your challenges and what's the burden uh, of drug resistant TB in your part of the country and if you can give uh, the overall burden in the country as well. Uh, well, if you look at the burden overall, TB in general, we have about, what, 2 billion cases in the world uh, right now who are infected, I mean, sorry, not necessarily cases. And from these, we have about, what, 10 million cases per year now, new cases annually, world over. And if you look at India, it's about, what, again, a little bit more than 2.5 million new cases a year. And I'm not sure how many people are aware of it, but about only six countries contribute to about 60% of the burden of TB, India being one of them. Okay, so that's a pretty, pretty large uh, uh, number. Now, if you look at MDRTB in sheer numbers, we're talking about numbers, okay, India is probably the second after China. But if you're going to look at it in proportion wise, as per your population, then probably we are not as bad compared to, say, Eastern Europe and, say, uh, you know, Central Asia. So we have an incidence in, in India of MDRTB of about what, uh, 1.3 lakhs, 1.35 lakhs uh, cases a year. This is as per 2018 figures. So about 3.5% in new cases, that means those who have not been treated or have been treated for less than a month for anti-TB uh, ATT. And in the case of retreatment cases, we have about what, about 18%. Uh, but what is worrying is that only about 40%, 44% of these estimated cases were actually diagnosed. And from these, only 36% are being treated. Again, this is 2018 figures. And these match, the figures in the Northeast also match, roughly match what is happening out uh, in the rest of India. There are a few high burden areas, particular places like Sikkim, my district, which is slightly higher, East Khasi Hills District, Meghalaya. So these are a bit of an issue. Now, if you're going to look at uh, the uh, India TB report of 2019, if you look at the second line LPAs that were performed out there, what they found was that there was resistance to fluoroquinolones in about 29% odd, almost 30%. So that's almost one third of the cases. Now, if you look at treatment to TB, MDR-TB, I mean, generally speaking, we have the shorter regimen and we have the oral longer regimen. Now, for initiating uh, treatment on the shorter regimen, you must have sensitivity to the uh, fluoroquinolones. So a big chunk of these, if you look at the LPA results, second line LPA results, they'll be showing mutations to either the gyrase uh, A, mutant 3B, C, and B. So once these are present, you can't use quinolones. So immediately you can't use a shorter regimen in these uh, patients. So that's a bit of an uh, issue. Again, notification as we're saying, because a large number of people, patients come to the private sector. Notification is an issue. When we rolled it out a few years back, it was extremely difficult convincing uh, private practitioners and hospitals. But slowly it has improved. Now, if you look at it as a program in India, again, the figures are quite, quite uh, encouraging. In 2018, we had about what, 2.4 million cases notified from the private sector, that jumped up to 2.9 million, almost 3 million in just one year, okay? So that is something, and then COVID uh, derailed uh, all this. So it's been pretty good, but we need to work much harder. And then there's another special cohort of the TB HIV group. Now this again is a very special population, as they call it double trouble, okay? It worsens both the HIV aspect as well as the TB aspect in almost all patients. We have about what, 77,000 odd patients. Out of these, only about 44,500 to 45,000 are actually notified and on ART. So a lot of work needs to be you know, done regarding this. So overall, the biggest worry that personally I have and possibly maybe others will be having is that I hope we are not underestimating our uh, numbers out here. That could be a problem. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Very important information coming from you. Uh, so I'll come to uh, Professor Ashok Ratan, sir. So, sir, we have seen that during this COVID time, so one, at least one good thing or, you know, uh, something has happened that we have seen a lot of labs mushrooming in tier two, tier three cities uh, with molecular diagnostic facilities. 
So what is your view on the decentralization of diagnostic services, especially in the private sector? So if you can share with us. And I'd also request Dr. Ajay Farke if, if, if you can also contribute in this, in this same question after Dr. Ratan sir finishes. Sorry, you're on mute. I'll start with what happened with Pathkind Labs. Uh, we were roped into the JEET projects in uh, March 2020, along the time of, uh, of the lockdown. As soon as the lockdown opened, we started performing uh, uh, CVNAT tests from private sectors. And uh, till the end of the project, we did 18,000 gene expert tests with reporting back to the treating physician within 24 hours from Patna, Varanasi, Lucknow, Kanpur, Agra, and Gurgaon, including uploading the data into Nikshay in real time. We increased the number of gene, gene expert equipment as well as manpower and uh, the Gurgaon lab function 24 seven. These efforts were highly appreciated by the treating physicians as the results were going back in 24 hours. I feel that the private labs pay great attention to detail, which includes upskilling their capacity in response to projected increased workload so that the turnaround time is maintained. This would make ISO 15189 accredited private labs important players in providing diagnostic facilities to the patients in real time. So I would think that this is the right step to go. Excellent, sir. Kudos to your work. Thank you. Great work. So, Dr. Farke, if you, if you have to add it. Yes, sir. So, basically, if we look at about just three to four years ago, or maybe just before COVID, molecular diagnostics was available to a select few labs, you know, select few labs in the government and in the private sector. There were under 100 uh, labs which had molecular diagnostics in India, and hardly, and I think under 50 had enable accreditation. So when we, were, when we spoke about things like HIV viral loads or basic testing in molecular, even for uh, monsoon related illnesses like leptospirosis or dengue, the sheer logistic challenge to get these tests done was a big issue. Now, I think COVID has acted as a major catalyst in actually allowing people to enter and start, uh, take molecular diagnostics from being an esoteric test to entering the mainstream. And uh, that has actually happened by, by the simple requirement of testing. So the demand for testing actually propelled people to start labs and start, start molecular diagnostics. And they, they were able to take that uh, CapEx initiative and actually start it. And uh, since now we have all this, uh, and this would not have happened if it wasn't for COVID. It, 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 it would have taken maybe 10 years for us to reach anywhere close to what we are today. So this has led to a uh, mushrooming, I would also say, of certain labs, uh, many of which uh, we don't, uh, they've just been started for molecular diagnostics. So once COVID sort of uh, alleviates, I don't know how many of them will continue and go into routine testing. But since we do have thousands of labs in molecular diagnostics now all over India, I think it's a great opportunity for uh, the private as well as the public sector to offer different kinds of tests, which were once esoteric tests to the common man and uh, make turnaround times much shorter. And just like tuberculosis, we hope that uh, things like leptospirosis, dengue, and many of these other illnesses, especially in ICU settings like sepsis, if we're able to give reports to uh, ICUs in 12 hours because of the molecular labs, it will have a major impact. And then oncology as well, will see a big boost because of this, because uh, multiplex PCR panels are out there now for circulating tumor cells. So the reach of molecular tests because of this has been extraordinary. And I think it would really benefit uh, India in the long run. Excellent, excellent. So thanks for your input. So this is a phenomenal work that we can do actually with this kind of molecular settings <clears throat> established across the country. So my previous the previous panelists have elaborated that loss to follow is a big challenge. So I'd like to ask the next question to Dr. Amita Joshi. So ma'am, uh, this taste can treat model, how do you see this is going to help the TB patients going forward when these newer molecular diagnostic tools are being included and this advanced treatment regimens in place. So what's your view? Yeah, uh, like I mentioned, uh, I think when I was speaking before also, we have already come out with the programmatic management of drug resistance TB 2021. 
And if you look, we are no longer saying diagnostic algorithm. We are saying integrated DRTB diagnostic and treatment algorithm. Okay. And looking at the al algorithm upfront, when the two samples come, we are offering them a NAT. It, uh, whether it be CB NAT or whether it be a true NAT, because we know at our district levels, we need the true NAT because that can work on the battery backups, which are there and it has given excellent, even for extra pulmonary over there. And based on the outcomes which are there, that means if I detect resistance or not detect resistance, the second sample is going reflexly onto a culture DST lab, where we are doing first line followed by second line LFA, if it is a smear positive, and based on the results, the year first time I'm doing to see whether the INHA mutation, because that is associated with etonamide resistance that we are inferring. And second line LPA for a resistance to, of course, uh, liboflox, moxie, and amikacin. These are the drugs that we are doing, though we know now injectables is not there. So if I have got a resistance to rifampicin, that means I've detected and got rifampicin resistance, but I do not have any other resistance, whether it is to my quinolones or whether to any of my INH uh, isoniazide, we know such an individual can be given the shorter oral BDQ. So the diagnostic, when we also teach and the lab set up, we said, yes, this is a candidate where you can start them with the oral shorter BDQ containing uh, MDR regimen. But if I get a resistance detected, in an isoniazide, either in the CADG or in my INHA, not, not both, that candidate also, provided he start having any quinolone resistance, can be given a shorter oral BDQ regimen. On the other hand, if I have a BDQ resistance, I mean, a fluoroquinolone resistance detected with INH showing both in INHA as well as CADG, such a candidate is the one which we are giving the longer oral. See, because all our regime, if you go to see in the national program, has shifted towards the oral regime, okay? There are stray cases where we are allowing the clinicians to go ahead with injectable. That is individual, what we're talking about. And on the other hand, supposing if I am getting a resistance, which is not being detected, that means I detected TB, but I did not de detect any rifampicin. That sample is also going in now to the culture DST lab, where we are doing the first line and second line LPA. And if I do not detect the resistance to isoniazide, the clinician continues with this drug-sensitive TB regime that is already been initiated, okay? Whereas if I detect if, uh, if I'm, uh, isoniazide resistance, we know such an individual is now eligible to what we call the H-mono or the poly uh, DRTB regime. So we have placed these tests where upfront we're giving NAT followed by first line, second line LPA, initiating the liquid culture and doing DST. Now what DST we are doing will depend upon isoniazide is being detected as resistance. Then yes, we are putting in for uh, quinolones, we are putting in for our uh, parazinamide, we are putting in for linozolod, we are also putting for cifazolin. And if I had rifampicin resistance, and is, this is a candidate where I can do a shot of the oral, then we are also putting, if those sites have already been, uh, what you say, past the equas, because already Bidaculin and Delamenid has also been said that they will be initiating. Few labs have passed, but not all across India have done their, this for uh, clofazimine and uh, have passed their PT panel, what we call. So treatment is then changed based upon whatever phenotypic. So even if you say, okay, I am doing an XDR cartridge, remember to date, you yet have to rely on a phenotypic culture DST when you're going to change the regimen when you're getting, because it is that these higher drugs or which have already come into and a part of my initial regime, that is my BDQ, my clofazimine and all, this is not being taken care of. So we cannot do away with phenotypic at this present juncture. So we do have both the treat and the, uh, uh, what you say, um, diagnose and treat model already there. Now it's only, like I said, how we ramp it up by involving everybody across, whether it's a public or the private sector that we are talking about, okay? Excellent. Really great to listen to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So uh, my next question to Camilla, ma'am. Ma'am, again, referring to your uh, publication and the clinical trial in three different countries. So we have discussed uh, that expert uh, against this PDST or CDST, but if you can elaborate how this expert MDB XTR fared against the existing LPA technology. 
Yeah, one of the advantages of, of doing this study was that we did everything. It was the full Monty, so to speak. So we actually correlated all our culture positives on an LPA, both first line and second line LPAs. And we found that it was exactly the same. The results of the expert XDR were exactly the same, except detection of INH was slightly better than LPA uh, in the expert XDR, possibly because there are two more target sites, the Fab G1 and the OxyR AHPC intergenic uh, region. But uh, what we need to really think about now, India has really ramped up extremely well for the LPA. If there is a place for the XP, expert XDR, it's, it's, a, it's really doing as the results were literally 100% correlating with, with LPA, is that uh, we'll have to look at uh, you know, how India and other low-income countries can, uh, or high-burden countries with varying infrastructure capabilities, remember that it's not just one size fit all, how we can actually slot this, like, like was told earlier, we need to actually look at how we can slot the 10 color calibration upgrade or the module swap at every one of the expert sites. Because no question, a decentralized option is the way to go. It will put the load off the, off the, you know, the reference labs. They'll be able to do better work like whole genome, et cetera. And we'll be closer to the patient if we move this. But how it's going to work at every site is something that we'll really have to look at. But the performance uh, was exactly the same. A quick question to Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, did you, did you look at the um, gain in sensitivity, which is specific to FabG and HPC, where uh, CADG and NHL were It, it, it was type? marginally better. Yes, it was marginally better with expert okay. XDR. No question about it. Yes. It Do was. you have a number? I mean, I, we have seen I in some it was, studies. It, it was nine. I can't remember off the top, but it was possibly nine samples totally that was included. Yeah. I see. Thank I, you. I, I, I may stand to be corrected, but I think it was about nine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So my question, uh, next question to Dr. Ugoshi, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you're in a very important position. You're coming with huge experience. So uh, what's your view? I think, uh, I mean, again, I'll in relation to, to Dr. Camilla's comments and everything. So what's your view on the future of drug resistant tuberculosis uh, diagnosis in the country? And why do you think that uh, this will be adopted by the government uh, in the country guidelines? If we can throw some light on that. I think that's a little difficult to... Okay, let me, let me first begin with, you know, the uh, like I said earlier, the placement of the XDR TB diagnosis is very, very important. Now, you see why... Uh, all of us have been saying we are the number one in, you know, adding to the burden of TB. And to, the TB, and to the burden of MDR-TB globally. So though, uh, if you look at the molecular um, epidemiology, there are other countries as well where MDR-TB is high. What I'm actually trying to arrive at is that there are definitely hotspots of MDR-TB transmission. So unless we can diagnose MDR-TB and curtail the transmission, we are actually losing out on these patients. So if you remember the older days when BCG used to be given at six weeks, the government modified it to zero day. So it's before the infant is actually taken out, the baby infant is given the BCG vaccine. So I am trying to, uh, you know, to actually raise this concern. It is important for us all when we know there's a pathogen and there's a, there's a person who is suffering from the disease. So for the sake of the the the, the the patient and for the sake of the community, the earlier we diagnose it, the better. So the program initiated the universal DST algorithm way back, you know, a few years ago, and has been working very hard to actually uh, bring it to the periphery, you know, patient near approach and so on and so forth. There has been an immense input to do that. But you know, the, the, the strengthening of the detection of rifampicin resistance is, is also very important. Like I said, to, so again, you know, uh, India is one country where bedaculin is available and is available, uh, you know, of course, under the program very carefully, um, you know, but to initiate any of these shorter oral regimens or even for that matter, longer regimen, we need to know quinolone resistance. We need to know whether we can use high edge. We need to know whether we can use MOXIE. 
high dose moxie, whether that can be put to use. And like, uh, you know, several of my colleagues have said, Amika Sun is still not out. Of course, you know, we, the WHO is recommended only in dire needs, you know, it, it can be put to use. But there's such time that we can actually take our treatment program to the periphery in a big way. We are still dependent on these drugs. Of course, there, there's a big furor in certain countries where they say injectables should be totally out, children should never be subjected. We are aware of the flaws of these drugs. But if we are wanting to save somebody from mortality, we probably have to depend on such drugs. So what I would say is the program and the, the experts which are on the, uh, you know, which are policymakers and which are, uh, so there is a big drive to achieve the best. And the physicians and the lab experts all really feel that you know, early detection of uh, MDR and XDR is essential. Line probe assay was, was actually uh, um, uh, given uh, the due, uh, uh, you know, we, we have had line probe assay at the periphery for, for quite some time. But if this cartridge is able to reduce the time taken, is able to work on smear negative samples, is able to work on extra pulmonary samples, and it saves time for the program, helps break the chains of transmission, program would be most eager to take. In fact, the, the, the move towards shorter oral regimen will only be enabled by, uh, you know, something as quick and as uh, near patient as the cartridge here we're talking about. So yes, I would say all experts on the program are very eager to do it. But then I think um, uh, two or three things uh, at the end of Sephir would also be helpful. If rifampicin could be part of one cartridge, if one cartridge solves the whole issue, that will be really great. And of course, the questions that were raised earlier that the infrastructure throughout the country, if the six color systems can be upgraded to 10 color systems. And if the costing of the XDR cartridge, we have not yet talked about. You know, it's it, we are a, a low middle income country or middle and whatever. The point being, if the program is working very hard to bring the diagnosis and treatment to the patient, uh, you know, as near patient as possible. But if there can be some support from, uh, you know, the uh, Safir and the other manufacturers of NADS, it would definitely be simpler to roll out. So in, in addition to universal DST, only for if we'll be able to offer universal DST for the other second lines, which are the only way we can treat the RIF resistant. So um, I guess the, the message is very clear. It depends on how soon we can uh, actually have uh, the other aspects put in place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, Dr. Somite, should you like to ask anything? Oh, uh, I think it was a wonderful discussion. Very enriching. Thank you, all the panelists, for this deep insight. Yeah, thank you so much. So we have very limited time. So I see a lot of questions in the chat box. So one final question to Dr. Michael Molong. So if you can just speak uh, on just two liners on this INH mono resistance, the problem in our country and how the concept of reflex testing is going to address that. It's actually a very appealing uh, concept in an ideal world. We are not in an ideal world. That, that, that's where the problem is. So if a patient is resistant to rifampicin straight up uh, with the Gene Expert Ultra or MTB RIF, yes, it's justified. You can go to use the XDR cartridge. Okay, this is from a private facility perspective. Now, what if the rifampicin is resist, uh, sensitive? Now, if you look at world figures, when you combine both new cases as well as uh, previously treated cases for INH mono resistance, it works out to about 19%. So that's one in every five. If you look at India, it works out to a little bit more than 11%. That comes out to one in every nine patients. Okay, so can you justify using it for all specimens, both rifampicin sensitive as well as resistant, and then reflexively test them with uh, the XDR? I, I really am not, uh, you know, very sure about that, particularly in places where, you know, our country is poor with all said and done. I work in a hospital where 80% of the patients rely on the state insurance services as well as Ayushman Bharat. They provide no help whatsoever for OPD patients. 
So diagnosing it on an OPD basis becomes very difficult using these high-end uh, and expensive uh, diagnostics. I have a patient who has to travel four hours, come back by vehicle, reach the hospital, no food, sees the doctor, doctor orders some tests, you go to the counter to pay for the test and then he finds out he doesn't have enough money, checks all his pockets, pulls out everything he can. And he says, sir, sir, I'm so sorry, I just don't have enough money and I need to save a bit to go back home. What do you do in these cases? And I'm telling you, this is a story that's going to be repeated across so many hospitals across our country. Okay, so in an ideal world, yes, that would be lovely if we could reflexively test it. But I'm really not sure if you're, you know, uh, ready, ready for it. If the government is going to support it, nothing like it. And TEP, if it takes it up, which is going to be highly doubtful because even the gene ultra, uh, gene expert ultra cartridges have not been rolled out. It's a huge uh, economical as well as logistical endeavor. It's not going to be easy. They're going to have to do a cost benefit analysis and then, you know, see if it works out. With the present infrastructure, are they happy? What about the turnaround times when you compare second line LPA, first line LPA versus uh, the gene expert? So these are questions which only the program can answer, and I'm not privy uh, to this kind of information. So having said that, yes, in an ideal world, it would be excellent if we could reflexively test. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have, because of paucity of time, we have to, yes, ma'am, please. Can I please? just make one small point? Yes, in yes, sure, to... sure, ma'am. So please. Dr. Molo very rightly pointed out that, you know, in a, in a so universal DST will help us, one, to identify INH resistance as well. So for treatment of INH resistance, we have the levoflox to be added to the other three drugs. So we'll have resistance to levoflox as well. So that way, it will simplify things for us. That's why the question of INH monoresistance was very useful. The, the national DRS actually showed um, to the tune of 25% in previously treated and 12% in previously untreated drug night patients. So the numbers that are projected in the DRS were, were high for INH resistance. And we need to treat these patients using certain drugs, otherwise they'll land up into an MDR if you don't treat them properly now. So I guess that's where universal drugs are attributed to all these, uh, you know, the, the essential drugs. So, yeah, just, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So thank Dr. You so Dr. Dave, I, I have just yeah. one question for the panelists. Uh, I mean, given the fact that um, SLIDs will be phased out soon, uh, near future, how important would you think that a cartridge which can detect rifampicin, isoniazid, and chloroquinolone in a single cartridge would be? Is it something which would be important? And, and then reflexing that to a oral regimen cartridge. So I guess that that works beautifully. So you decide rif resistance, you immediately can plan out your, uh, uh, you know, the treatment regimen that one could actually start. But it would be still better if you could add bedaculin and lunisolid onto these. You see, that then resolves the whole story. You have the group yeah. A, you, you just need these five. You, you can have your group A drugs along with the group B, one or two, whichever you need to add. So you usually need four and then tensor phase followed by three. So if you have all the three, uh, you know, of course, uh, if you have the three group A drugs, you can add one from the group B. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Wonderful. I think this is, uh, unfortunately, we have come to the end of this webinar because of paucity of time. So I thank everyone of these panelists, the speakers, including the participants for making this so useful, so fascinating. And, you know, as a citizen of India, I salute to all of these panelists for the hard work, for the contribution, for, uh, you know, for the betterment of the four countrymen. So I thank everyone and uh, have a great evening. And, you know, we just concluded a great academic fest. So thank you, thank you, everyone, and each one of the panelists, speakers, and participants again. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye, bye Thank you so thank much. You. Bye, bye Thank you. Thank you, everyone, especially the participants thank for uh, wonderful questions. And thank, thank you. the organizers. <laughs>